All right. In this video, I want to talk about what is your standard. As in, what is it that you use to determine what is true and what is false? What is right and what is wrong? And ultimately, if we're being honest with ourselves, we make ourselves the, the standard. As in, we're the, the foundation to determine what is true, what is wrong, what is right, and what is wrong. So when we come across something, like let's say, uh, in this case, what I want to talk about is religions, we will judge it based on, on whether or not we like it, right? So let's say you're a woman and you learn about Islam and the position that they put women in and how, uh, you know, the men, they get 78 virgins when they go to heaven and stuff like that. And there's not really any promises for women, right? And you're like, I don't like that, right? So it's not as though you determined whether or not it's true or not. You just said, I don't like it. And then if you come across something like, uh, let's say Buddhism, and you're like, oh, this is interesting, you know, the meditations and stuff, but it's not really practical for my life where, you know, how am I going to further my career and my business and my, my life uh, sitting around here meditating, right? So you, you, you like, I don't like it, right? Because it, it doesn't benefit what I want to do in life. So, again, you make yourself the standard and you dismiss it, not because you found out if it was true or not, that this is the right path to take. It's just, I don't like it, so I'm not going to go on it. And then you come to Christianity. And God tells you that you're a sinner. Not only have you sinned and you need to have your sins paid for, but you yourself are a corrupted being that needs to be changed. You need to be born again. And you're like, oh, it, it doesn't look good on at humanity at all. Like mankind is trash in the eyes of God. It's like, hmm, I don't like this. So again, you don't look into it to see if this is true or not. I just don't like it, so therefore it's not true. I don't like it, therefore it's wrong, right? And then when you come across something that you actually like, like, like say you're a man and you come across something like Islam or Mormonism, where you can have multiple wives and you're a lustful fella. And you're like, yeah, OK, I like that. So therefore, this is right and it's true because I like it. Right. And. You, the same thing, you go into something like Buddhism, and you're like, oh, I like the relaxation of uh, the meditation practices and stuff. And, you know, it basically makes us our, our God because we look into ourselves to find the truth, and we basically become the truth. And you, you like that, so you stick with that. And um, maybe with uh, Christianity, you, you find that you can actually... Uh, preach what people want to hear, and they'll give you money for doing it. So you like that. So therefore, it's right. It's true now, and you follow that. So ultimately, in life, not just concerning religion, that's just what I want to focus on. We ourselves become the standard, the foundation to determine what is truth, what is false, what is right, and what is wrong. And this is where we all get mixed up because everybody is deciding for themselves and they're making their own standard. So when actual objective facts come into play that refute our subjective beliefs, we reject it, right? Because we don't actually have a standard other than ourselves. We made ourselves a standard. So if anything goes against our subjective belief, we'll reject it. Uh, 
we can see that today where there's people who, uh, let's start with uh, atheists, right? They don't believe there's a God. And they make the claim there is no God. That's why they're atheists. They're not agnostic. Agnostics don't know. Atheists are flat out saying there isn't a God. But then when you show them simple things of, well, life and consciousness cannot come from something not alive and not conscious. That's science. You know, you can make predictions of that, that if something's alive, it came from something living. If something's conscious, it came from something conscious. And I know the atheists would say something along the lines, well, all right, well, then where did God come from? He's alive and conscious. I was like, good question. There can't be an infinite regress because we would never be at this point of life. So if there had to be a creator for God and then a creator for that being and so on and so forth to bring forth the life, we would never actually get to the point where we get to God and then to the point where God creates us. Right. There has to be an ultimate beginning. And you share with this an objective truth that there can't be an infinite regress and that life and consciousness only comes from something alive and conscious. And they dismiss it because why? It doesn't fit their subjective belief. And because it doesn't fit their subjective belief, it is now false and it is wrong. And ultimately, they don't, they don't like it because admitting there's a God means that you're subject to him. You have to answer to him. And you don't like that, right? And then you got these people who are believing that they're things that they're not, right? They're subjectively saying, like a man saying, I'm a woman. They're subjective women saying that they're men. There's a subjective point of view of both men and women saying that they're cats or dogs or something else uh, or babies, right? They, they, they're not the right age that they say they uh, that they actually are, right? They're just making things up. They're living in a subjective, deluded reality and ignoring objective truth, right? Because we've all made ourselves the standard, and that's what ends up happening. And ultimately, uh, we need to get to the point where we go after the truth. And what's interesting is that God tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. So if you actually want the truth and you search out the truth, you're actually searching out God without actually realizing it. And while doing all these things, ultimately you'll be led to him. Uh, an example is myself. Uh, there was a point where I was atheistic and then agnostic. And then I wanted to look into spiritual things. So I looked in different religions, a uh, little bit of Christianity, but not so much because growing up, I thought Christians were fools and looked at uh, things like Mormonism and Islam. And then what really got my attention was the, the Buddhism kind of stuff and uh, getting into these things. Eventually, I went to like Gnosticism, where Gnosticism is supposed to be about knowledge, and it's ultimately to be about knowing God. Uh, but they divert it kind of like Buddhism, where uh, you're God and you look within yourself to find God, and all these kind of nonsense like that. But ultimately, I was looking for truth, so it was like a stepping stone going through these things. But all these times when I decided that these, these things were true and they were right, I didn't have a standard. I was just making that claim because that's what I wanted. I want it to be true. I want it to be right. So therefore it is. And that's how people are. And they get stuck in that. Uh, but ultimately, if we're being honest, we end up coming to the conclusion that uh, the Bible, the King James Bible, if we speak English, is the standard. You look into it and you look at things like creation and you realize evolution is a farce where you look at the DNA, for example, uh, when you're breeding, let's say, uh, dogs or horses. If you have a base pair of DNA 
with the wolves, let's say to keep it simple, we'll keep it a low number, a thousand base pairs in the father and mother wolf. And you start breeding them to get the dogs we have today. What ends up happening is you are messing with those genetics where there's always a scrambling or a loss of information. There's never an add of information. So there's always going to be a thousand base pairs or less in the children. And you can't reverse the process of the breeding, right? You can't go all the way to the Chihuahua and then go back and start breeding back to get back to the wolf because you can't add the information that was lost. You can only remove it. This is science. Anytime there's been a mutation where something's added, every time it has been harmful, where you get uh, these protein copies, duplications in the DNA, and you get these people who are crippled and mentally deficient. You get the chromosome duplications and you get Down syndrome, right? You, you get all these things where there's a, something messes up when you add to it. When you remove, it, it still functions, but it isn't what it used to be. Uh, the way I like to put this is that, let's say the DNA is a book and it's a book of truth, right? So when you have the wolf with a thousand pairs of DNA, it's the truth of the wolf, right? A thousand base pairs tells the story of the wolf. And if you remove from that book, well, what's left is still the truth, right? So it still continues. But if you add to it, well, that's a, a lie, right? So no, it's no longer the truth. It's no longer the story of the wolf. And it ends up messing everything up and you get genetic defects. Um, now, an atheist would say, well, when they breed certain uh, horses, right, they'll have a, a horse that has something like 38 chromosomes, and there's a horse that has something like 34 chromosomes, and when they mate, the child will have 36 chromosomes. And they're like, see, it's adding information. And I was like, how do you figure? You have one that has 38, and now it lost two. It's down to 26. I mean, 36, from 38 to 36. Yeah, the horse that had 34, the child has 26, has more, but the child's never going to have more than what is given by the parent, right? That child's not going to have 40 uh, chromosomes. It's always the same amount as the parents or less, right? And one of the parents has 38, it, so that child's either going to have 38 or less because that's the highest amount. It's a loss of information. And uh, now that child that has 36 chromosomes, no matter what, its child's not going to have uh, ever be able to get back to 38. Even if it mates with a horse that has 38 chromosomes, that horse may get to 37 because it's the in-between, but that's all it's going to get to, right? It's never going to be able to get back. Um, uh, another thing they'll say is about the yeast. I remember this one where uh, showing intelligent design where they actually put a functioning code of DNA into, uh, I believe it was yeast. And it functioned. Right. But this shows that it took intelligent design to put the information in. But what they don't tell you is that the yeast ended up eventually correcting the genetic change, removing it and never passed on the information that was added. So it would just last it in the group that they put it in, and it didn't last long, and they never passed on the, the genetics that were added. Uh, so very key there, very important stuff. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so you learn that about the scriptures, right? And then you look at the flood, and you're like, the whole world was flooded, and you might think that's kind of funny. But then you look into it and you're like, hey, all these things that they call strata that it took, they say, millions of years to form. Well, how come there's trees fossilized through multiple layers of these million year old layers of supposed strata? And then you realize what happened was a flood and hydraulic sorting where they sorted by density and, and layers and they buried things like trees and animals so that they can actually be fossilized in multiple layers at one time. And they're not as old as they're saying. So where we see these stratas in the, all over the earth shows a global flood. 
And uh, some of these big craters that we see that we think were meteor hits might have actually be where the scriptures tell us that the fountains of the deep burst open and the earth burst open. It wasn't that something hit the earth, but the earth itself broke open and waters from under the earth gushed out. And uh, you start to get more and more trust with the scriptures. Then you look at some strange things like in Joshua, where he prays to have more time, and it says that the sun and the moon stood still. And you start to think about that, and you're like, okay, well, if I believe this, and you believe current science about, oh, the earth is a globe spinning, and you're thinking, well, if the earth stopped after going a thousand miles an hour, it would destroy the earth. And then if it went from zero to a thousand miles an hour again, to start the day back up, it would cause destruction all over the earth as well. That didn't happen. So you start to think about that and you're like, well, that doesn't line up. But then when you go and you look at time lapse of the stars and you see the North Star Polaris doesn't move. And if the earth was spinning on a wobble, you would see that. Not to mention all the other stars are going in perfect circles around Polaris. And you'll be thinking, how is that possible if they're saying we're spinning, but also on a wobble, also while we're flying around the sun? And you start to look at the science and you're like, oh, that ain't right. And you start to get more trust in the scriptures. And then you start coming to the scriptures where it starts prophesying of Jesus and Daniel with the kingdoms. And you start to see. Yeah, from Babylon, they were taken over by Medo-Persia, then they were taken over by Greece, then they're by Rome. And then this last kingdom, right before Jesus is supposed to return, it's Rome mixed with, looks like Israel. Right? So we take a look at that. And we're like, hey, that, that actually fits, right? Daniel told us about these kingdoms as a statue, the head of gold being Babylon being taken over by chest and arms of silver, which was Medo-Persia. And it tells us the belly and thighs of brass is uh, Greece that took them over. And then legs of iron, which is Rome, that took them over and took over the world. Then there's a broken up Rome. This is, it's partly iron, partly clay. It's broken up. It's partly strong, partly weak. And we see today with what's going on around the world, I got to make sure I don't say anything that gets this flagged, but... Uh, there's economic issues and currency collapses and digital dollars being introduced. And we also see the mixture of Rome and Israel. You go to the nation of Israel, Israel's back as a nation. They're the clay. And irons mixed with them, you see Catholicism all over Israel. So you see, hey, we're at, at the end. And this was predicted long before it happened. Right? And you start to look at those kind of things. And then you look, like at Revelation, you start to look at those things. And you, you see, hey, this book is of God. It actually told us the end from the beginning. This is an objective truth. This is the word of God. This is my standard. And you finally get that faith that's like, this is my standard. This is the light for my path. So my feet won't stumble and I won't be led astray because I actually have the word of God. So then you start comparing everything to what you're reading in the scriptures. And then you start saying, no, the scriptures is my standard. I actually have a standard now of determining what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong. But uh, yeah, sometimes it takes us a while to get there, and sometimes we're stubborn, and sometimes we just fight it. But uh, yeah, with that being said, set your standard. Build yourself upon the rock. Thanks for watching. That fella couldn't join the church. 
He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So a fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tie, didn't tie. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. <laughs> you have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. 